Hey friends, today is part two of our Psalm 18 study, and we're going to talk today about the God that rescues us. We started an introduction yesterday about this psalm, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this imagery of rescue that we see that is so prevalent. And I think the encouragement is the God that is revealed in the Psalms is the same God that we serve today. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so as we see this nature and character of God revealed in the Psalms, we can be encouraged that that is the same God that intervenes on our behalf today. I pray this episode blesses you. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know that you have been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus, how he calls them, how he encourages them, how he equips them. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, helping you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I also include a lot of cultural and historical information that makes these familiar passages of scripture really come alive. This is a great study to do with maybe your teen girls or a group of friends from church, and it will really help you gain confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Today, we are in part two of Psalm 18. I'm going to go ahead and read it again. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence clouds advanced, with hailstones and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemies, great bolts of lightning, and routed them. The valley of the seas were exposed, and the foundations of the earth laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils, He reached down from on high, and he took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, 
you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. You broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back until they were destroyed. I crushed them so that they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed me with strength for the battle. You made my adversaries bow at my feet. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight, and I destroyed my foes. They cried for help, but there was no one to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. I beat them as fine as dust born on the wind. I poured them out like mud in the streets. You've delivered me from the attacks of the people. You have made me the head of the nations. People I did not know are subject to me. As soon as they hear me, they obey me. Foreigners cringe before me. They lose all heart. They come trembling from their strongholds. The Lord lives. Praise be to God, my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From violent men, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you among the nations, O Lord. I will sing praises to your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Today we are continuing our discussion of Psalm 18 because it's quite a lengthy psalm, the longest one we've done so far. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to go back and listen to yesterday's episode where it talks about the overview and some of the initial imagery we see in Psalm 18 and the heart behind why David wrote Psalm 18 as a response to God's hand of protection in the victory over his enemies. And so we're going to get into some more of the imagery today because I think it's important to kind of take some of that into account. And so I want to read for you verse 4. It says, The cords of death are entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. The cords of death where it's talking essentially about the grave, is something that was commonly used by hunters in the ancient Near East. And so this is a metaphor where it's talking about those noose snares. And it's really essentially a metaphor about death. But not just death, it's saying that death is the hunter. So by using this this metaphor, the ancient Near Eastern audience would have recognized that this was a metaphor for, for death-seeking David out. So for many of the cultures, um, Sheol, which would be a very real place, we talked about this a, a couple times this week, where basically people would would live, but they kind of would live in it it just a bare existence. They would eat clay and dust and they would kind of hope that their descendants would take care of their needs. There were gates and gatekeepers to keep the dead people inside this place of Sheol. And it was called the land of no return. And so you can see descriptions of this found in other ancient writings. Um, the Akkadians especially have epics about this place of Sheol. And so apparently the Hebrew view of the grave was not that much different, although there's not a real elaborate description here. We know from other ancient writings that, that the Hebrew view was very much the same thing, that Sheol was a place, obviously, that you wanted to avoid. We're going to go down to verse 7. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. This idea of the earth trembling, um, and we see this basically, this next section, verses 7 through 15, it's really describing this saving intervention that Yahweh, God, Yahweh is another word for God, in the Old Testament, you hear God referred to as Yahweh, or the Tetragrammatron, because they only used 
the letters that were consonants. They wouldn't use the vowels. And so the, the Tetragrammaton is referring to Yahweh, which is basically the name for God in the Old Testament. But anyway, um, there was the saving intervention of Yahweh that comes in the form of a thunderstorm. And so it alludes to the experience that the nation had up on Mount Sinai were thunderstorms, thunderbolts. That's a common language that refers to Yahweh and it refers to an intervention with God or interaction with God. And so that language is really common in the, the Near Eastern accounts of any time a deity appeared, especially in battle. So if the, imagery is talking about a thunderstorm that's an intervention it's kind of like that battle imagery that we talked about and of course David has just gone through battle so we're going to see a lot of the battle imagery in his writing and so the earthquakes that happened before this um, battle are essentially celebrating the power of God so we see this in other ancient writings too it's a very similar imagery that, that occurs when there's any kind of battle imagery and God is intervening. Sometimes there can be a connection between an earthquake and the deity's anger. And so the Assyrians would would adopt that kind of thinking and they would even adopt that warrior image for themselves using the um, imagery of a thunderbolt or um, the earthquake even to recognize themselves as, as mighty warriors. And so um, the imagery that we see here in Psalm 18, it's basically making the point that Yahweh is the mightiest force to be reckoned with in all of creation. In verse 8, it says, Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, burning coals blazed out of it. So this idea of smoke rising from his nostrils if you think about lightning from a thunderstorm, they would think about that as a fire from heaven. And that was really common to be thought of as a divine weapon from the divine warriors. And so even in Egypt, they had a hymn that would describe some of their gods that way as that being one of the weapons of, of the, the gods. And so when it talks about smoke coming from the nostrils, consuming fire come from his mouth. That is really an image that David is producing, saying that God was fighting for him. Let's jump down to verse 10. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. So when it talks about how he mounted the cherubim and flew, the word is translated, the word for mounted, it's translated as meaning to ride a chariot. So kings would ride into battle on chariots. So divine warriors were also portrayed as chariot riders because that was the vehicle of, of the time. So you would see this in Assyrian art. You would see this um, in lots of the Egyptian imagery, the Akkadian imagery, um, this idea of the cherubim. They were guardian spirits with wings, and, and God was basically enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant. And, and that imagery is all, all similar to what we're talking about here. And so this idea of cherubim naturally serves as this imagery of God's flying war chariot. So again, it's additional imagery where it's talking about God coming to join him in this battle. And I think it's important because, again, like we said at the onset of yesterday, Typically, the ancient Near Eastern texts would take, the, the kings would take all of the glory for themselves and describe in depth how they won the battle, of course, with the deity's help. Whereas here, we're seeing David really give all the glory and honor and credit to God. And he's basically saying, okay, God won this battle. I just was there. I was present for it. In verse 12, out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced with hailstones and bolts of lightning. Hailstones and bolts of lightning um, are often associated with the deity's appearance in a thunderstorm. So in the 
some of the alternate religions at the time, um, especially like with Baal, who was the storm god, he would de be depicted holding a lightning bolt in his hand. And so hail, in this instance, is how David is describing Yahweh's weapon. And it also appears in other places, especially in the Old Testament, and it, it really represents one of the acts of judgment of God against his enemies. So we see that in Exodus uh, chapters 9 and 24, we see that in Joshua, we see it in Job, we see it in Isaiah. And so hail often is a response of judgment against God's enemies. In verse 14, he shot his arrows and scattered the enemies, great bolts of lightning, and routed them. Again, it's talking about the lightning as a weapon. He shot his arrows. So lightning bolts were thought of as arrows from a divine warrior. So in the Babylonian texts, which, and I'm referring a lot to some of these other texts because I want you to see that this isn't just imagery based off of scripture, but it was something that was common to the culture of the time in the greater area of Mesopotamia. And so what we're seeing is David speak in the language of the people that were living at the time, explaining how God acted on his behalf. And so the Babylonian texts would have something similar. They would talk about how their gods had arrows on a string and they would refer to them as thunderbolts. And some of the other gods of some of the other religions at the time would talk about arrows being and thunder, thunderbolts being arrows of the, the deities. And so what we're seeing is David speak to those alternate religions and say, no, we have one God, his name is Yahweh, and he is the one that sends thunderbolts from heaven. He is the one that acts on our behalf. Down in verse 15, the valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blasts of breath from your nostrils. There's a couple things going on here. The valleys of the seas, which would refer to as the lowest portion of the sea, would be their valley, and the, the foundation would be the roots of the mountains. And so there was a thought that there was a limit of the earth that, that was a thir certain threshold before you would descend into the underworld, which is essentially death. It talks about this in Deuteronomy, in Jonah, um, and even later in some of the other Psalms, we'll get into some of the imagery of the death and the underworld. But in light of the reporting that David is doing about the deliverance, especially in the next verse, in verse 16, this verse can be understood to mean that David is basically on the brink of death, very close to the underworld, and that is where Yahweh reaches down and rescues him. I want to pause there for a minute. I don't know if you're like me, but I have had moments where I have been at that lower level, some would even say on the brink of death. And it's in that place that God reaches down and rescues us. If that's where you are today, I want you to know that there's nowhere you can go that you can escape God's love. And that he is a God that reaches down and rescues us in those moments. Throughout verses 12 through 15, Essentially what we're seeing is we are seeing these weapons of a divine warrior, that Yahweh, God, is our divine warrior that fights on our behalf. And so Yahweh's arrows, as we've seen, they're, they're considered to be bolts of lightning. In this whole idea of the divine warrior, the deity is fighting the battles on our behalf. And he's defeating the enemy on our behalf. There's this terminology when it talks about thundering in the ancient texts that is also a, somewhat of a royal rhetoric because some of the other gods that were celebrated at the time in other cultures that were alive at that same time, they would portray themselves as other instruments of the gods. And so different kings would say, I, for example, they would say, I am an instru instrument of the gods and I thunder against those that have violated the treaties or stood in the way of me expanding my empire or didn't pay their tax or their tribute. And so 
some of this terminology when it's talking about thundering or thunderbolts is really David saying, okay, kings of this world, you are not the king. Yahweh is king. And it is Yahweh who is in charge of handing out discipline or fighting for justice or rescuing me in, in the seasons where my enemies are attacking. Verse 16. He reached down from on high and he took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. While that seems self-explanatory, I want to make sure we're paying attention. He drew me out of deep waters. Have you ever been so deep that you feel like you can't get out? You've been so deep in your sin or your lifestyle or your mess or your brokenness that you don't feel like you can get out? The God that is revealed in the pages of Psalms is the same God that wants to reveal himself to you. And it says he reaches down from on high and he takes hold of us and he draws us out of deep waters. Last year, I did a podcast episode on this, so I'm not going to go into deep, deep detail. But there was a season um, when I was, I really struggled with this concept. I was a young girl. I was probably about 15. And I had gone with a group, uh, a youth group, to a whitewater rafting trip. And we were poor at the time. The fact that I even scrounged out 20 bucks to go on this trip was kind of miraculous. I worked three jobs as a, as a 15 year old kid. I had three jobs. And so I sacrificed some of my grocery money that week to go on this whitewater rafting trip. And so when we pulled in, there was two whitewater rafting companies in the same parking lot. On one side, you had the shiny, bright colored, uh, glossy photographs of the, the company that we had set out to come participate with and on the other side of the parking lot you had a real janky operation that was their boats were black they you know there was no helmets it was just a whole different no sign <laughs> it was just a whole different ball game but it was cheaper to go to the no name one versus the glossy one and so us being a group of young teenagers um and one adult we convinced him in an effort to save collectively you know probably like 80 bucks to go with this other operation. And so we kind of watched what the other operation did, and we just figured if we did what they did, now the other boats, the fancy, shiny, glossy, brightly colored boats, they had guides that went with them in each of the boats, but the black boats did not include a guide. And so we just figured if we watched what they did and we followed along with what, what they did, then we would be fine. Except we didn't know the river. And that's the difference when you when you have a guy they know the river. But when we went down the river, it seemed to the rest of our team that was in our boat that going to the right side of the river looked like the easy path. And we couldn't quite figure out why the guides were going down the left side of the river because that was looked a lot more dangerous and a lot more rocky. And so we went to the right side. And what we didn't realize at the time is that a little bit later down the river, there would be a fork. And if you were not already on the left side of the river, you were going to get sucked into the right side. And when you went down the right side, it was incredibly dangerous. And at that point, it was too late. And so we went over one of the, the rapids. And as we went over, our boat, our, our boat had pulled it into the air. And I was sucked underneath the boat. And I was trapped between the boat and this rock that was slimy and covered in green stuff. I don't know what it would be. Algae? Moss? I don't know. Anyway, it was covered... And water was coming over that rock, pushing me down. And any hope I had of getting out was lost because the boat was also being pushed down by the water. So I was literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. I had this boat pushing down on me with all this water being pushed down on me. And then this rock on the other side of me. And I remember looking up and I could see the sky. I was not that far under the water. Far enough that I couldn't breathe and I couldn't get up but I was not far enough under the water and I remember just looking up thinking okay well it's a good thing I'm a Christian and I know I'm going to heaven and I kind of I, I mean there was no fighting it there were, I was literally trapped and just kind of waiting for death to happen and I don't know how it happened other than it was a miracle of God a hand reached down into the water and pulled me out somehow that leader of that boat single-handedly was able to get the boat 
flopped back over and pull people back into the boat. Everybody else had their heads above water, but I was stuck underneath the boat. And he was able to see me, reach down, and pulled me out of that water. That's the imagery I think of every time I read verse 16. He reached down from on high and took hold of me and drew me out of deep waters. Friend, I want to tell you that if you are in over your head, we serve a God that will come down and draw you out of those deep waters. You have to want it. You have to ask for it. He's not going to do it without your permission. But he will reach down to where you're at and he will pull you out. I'm, I'm living proof of it. It's happened to me physically, literally physically, and it's happened to me spiritually. I, I remember a season of my life where I was in over my head and I had not started yet down this lifestyle of sin, maybe a little bit of sin, but not this lifestyle of sin. But I remember thinking, I can't get out of this. Like I, I am powerless over the situation. And, and if you go back and you read some of the stuff that I wrote in the She Hears Bible Study, I, I speak to this specifically about this idea of a Messiah and who we have in Jesus as the rescuer. So I would encourage you to go back and read that. But, but what I'm saying is in those moments, I remember praying this prayer, Lord, please take from me my life when I don't have the strength to give it away to you. And so this prayer, this asking is not saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to clean up my act. It's not saying, okay, God, I, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to go to church on Sunday and I'm going to resolve to have a stronger willpower and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to live for you. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a desperate prayer of the heart that says, God, I cannot do this on my own. I need your help. Lord, my prayer was, Lord, take from me my life when I don't have the strength to give it away to you. It was a lyric from a song, and I remember just singing that over and over, and this is the prayer of my heart, because I could not get myself out of the mess I had gotten myself into. And yet I saw God deliver me from that situation, and he has consistently delivered me from situations where I could not have gotten out on my own. See, when we're talking about addiction, and we're talking about brokenness. And we're talking about dealing with circumstances and situations that have been hand to, handed to us in life that we may have had no control over. And we feel helpless and overwhelmed. We have a God that reaches down. He reaches down from on high and takes hold of us and draws us out of the deep waters. Because that's who he is. He is Yahweh. He is the one that fights with thunderbolts to fight on our behalf. He is the one that leaves the heavens and comes down on earth in the form of Jesus to rescue us. That's who we serve. That's the God. That's Yahweh. Friends, that's the God that I want you to understand is revealed in the Psalms. The God that reaches down to rescue you where you're at. I'm going to read Psalm 18 again, but I want you to think about the God that fights on your behalf. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. When my God is my rock in whom I take refuge, he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. The earth trembled and quaked and the foundations of the mountains shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. But he parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. The dark rain clouds of the sky, out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced with hailstones and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemies, great bolts of lightning and routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the, breath, at the blast of breath from your nostrils, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. 
The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning away from God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but bring low those who are haughty. You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my lightness, my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against the troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. You broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. I pursued my enemies and overtook them. I did not turn back until they were destroyed. I crushed them so that they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. You armed me with strength for battle. You made my adversaries bow at my feet. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight, and I destroyed my foes. They cried for help, but there was no one to save them. To the Lord, but he did not answer. I beat them as fine as dust borne on the wind. I poured them out like mud in the streets. You've delivered me from the attacks of the people, and you have made me the head of the nations. People I did not know are subject to me. As soon as they hear me, they obey me. Foreigners cringe before me. They all lose heart. They come trembling from their strongholds. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From violent men you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you among the nations, O Lord. I will sing praises to your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. God, we recognize that you are a God that reaches down from on high, takes hold of us, and draws us out of deep waters. Lord God, I ask right now for my friends that feel like they are in deep waters, Lord God, would you rescue them? But Lord God, would you bring them to a place where they ask for rescue, that they recognize that they are powerless to get out of the situation themselves, that they recognize that you are the one that is mighty to save. God, we thank you for the way that David explains clearly that you are a God that fights on our behalf. In the midst of impossible circumstances, we can look to you to be our divine warrior, to be the one that stands in the gap between us and our enemies in our helplessness and defends us. God, I thank you for that kind of love. I thank you that you are a God that meets us where we are at. And you are a God that sent Jesus to intervene on our behalf. You left the heavens and through Jesus you came on our behalf to rescue us. Thank you, Lord God. We don't deserve it. And we recognize that it's only through your great love that we could even participate in such a rescue. Lord God, I pray for my friends specifically right now that are struggling. God, reach down and rescue them. We thank you that you are the same God today that is revealed in the Psalms. And we thank you that we can stand in assurance of knowing that you are a God that rescues us. We thank you and praise you in all things. Amen. Hey friends, real quick before we go, I want to let you know about some resources available to you in the shop at the shehears.org resources page. If you are following along the Psalms and you want to make notations in your Bible, there is some note-taking Bibles and some journaling Bibles that I put in the shop. They are ones that I personally would recommend that I have used and that I would endorse for this kind of note-taking. There's lots of space in the margins and thicker pages. Those are all available to you. And then also, For those of you that are looking for 
the next step to the Bible study. One of the things that I teach in the She Hears Bible study is the color method of study. That can be done on any passage of scripture. The whole goal of She Hears is to teach you how to hear from God as you're studying, studying the word. And so I also have some gospel journals, Bible journals, which is a really good next step. So you could even do maybe the Psalm study in the morning, and then you could do some personal color method study in the afternoon or however that works in your schedule. But the gospel journals are thicker paper. They're designed to work with our highlighters that we have, and it's designed to be kind of a next step for you when you've gone through the She Hears Bible study. Don't worry. Yes, I have more studies on the way, but I want to let you know about those resources that are available to you in the meantime. I pray they bless you. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. This podcast is supported by Morgan Stanley. What do you get from the Morgan Stanley client experience? Listening more than talking and a personalized plan to guide you through a changing world. To learn more, visit morganstanley.com slash why us. Investing involves risk. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, LLC.